Uh, right, so next up we have um, Catherine and Ellie from the Natural History Museum who are going to talk uh, from microfossils to mammoths and everything in between. How do you measure 28 million specimens? Mm -hmm. Do you come up? And do remember to talk into the microphone so that everyone can hear yes. along. Okay, cool. Um, can everyone hear me just to start with? Yeah. Okay, fab. That's a good start. Um, so good morning, everyone. I'm Katie, and this is Ellie, and we are both Collections Move team leaders at the Natural History Museum, working for the NHM Unlocked project, which you will have heard about. Um, and today we're going to talk about how on earth you go about measuring 28 million specimens. So um, this is just a quick summary of what we're going to talk about. And I will caveat by saying uh, this work was not carried out by just us. It was a huge team effort with lots of colleagues from across the museum, some of which are here today, which is really nice. Um, although we were really heavily involved in the development and implementation of this novel workflow. Um, this presentation will also be quite paleontology focused because this is the area that we both work in. But this workflow was carried out across all of our collections, including life sciences and our mineral and planetary science collections as well. So as I'm sure you will have heard in various other presentations if you were here yesterday, the Natural History Museum has re received funding to build a brand new purpose-built science and digitization center at Thames Valley Science Park in partnership with the University of Reading. Um, we're gonna move 28 million specimens and another 10 million in internally, but the ones moving to Reading include non-fossil and fossil mammals and invertebrates, our micropaleontology collections, our molecular collections, and the associated sectional libraries with these collections. Um, and the methodology that we're going to share with you today actually provided the data which informed the decision to move these specific collections, which is quite cool. And the last time the museum um, embarked on a collections move of this scale was in the 1880s, when the Britain, when the natural history portion of the British Museum moved to the beautiful Waterhouse building that it lives in now in 1881. Um, and this new move to Thames Valley is also one of the largest collections moves that has ever been carried out globally, which is both very exciting and also quite scary. So with a project of this scale, where do you even start? What's the first thing that you think about? So the most fundamental thing that we needed to understand was how big are our collections in actuality? Um, so we needed to understand not only the current volume and footprint of our collections, but also what the volume of our collections would be if they were all stored optimally, um, which is something that we term decompression space, and Ellie will talk more about that later. So in order to calculate this, we needed to map various bits of collections metadata to locations. So for example, if I was looking at this drawer, this is some of the information that I would want to know about it. So what type of collection is this? For example, this is a drawer of fossil mammals. Who is the responsible curator? What department does this material belong to? What are the dimensions of this drawer? What are the occupancy estimates, etc. cetera? Um, and I will say, as with many things, we started off thinking that we needed a few key pieces of data, but as the project progressed, this spiraled into many, many more bits of data that we needed um, as we kind of worked out what we needed to know specifically. Um, and as I mentioned, this data was all associated to collections locations records for it. So for example, a drawer or a shelf, which brings me on to locations. Um, so to collect any of this data, we needed a complete and consistent set of collections locations for all of co our collections areas at the lowest level available. So for example, a drawer or a shelf inside a cabinet. Um, we did face a little bit of expectations versus reality because as it turns out, maybe somewhat unsurprisingly, um, that what is useful for collections management when it comes to locations often differs between collections and can actually look quite different to what is needed to carry out a project of this scale across lots of different collections. So it quite quickly transpired that what we really needed to progress this work was to carry out an audit of all of our collections locations. So this initially involved exporting all of our locations data in EMU, which is our collections management system, and then basically physically cross-checking this with every location that was physically in the collections. This was no mean feat at all as we were working with around 217,000 different records. Um, so myself and a number of other colleagues spent a lot of time um, counting drawers and matching information between what was in the CMS with what was actually physically in front of us. So throughout this process, we recorded any issues or discrepancies, we added in any new locations, and then we worked with our fantastic and amazing data management team and curators to reconcile these updates with what was in the collections management system. 
We also standardized our allocation numbering systems, which was not consistent across the elections. Um, and we also devised a way to account for gaps in locations. So for example, where a space was available for a drawer, but there wasn't a drawer currently in that space because that method of dealing with that also differed across our collections. But the biggest challenge by far, and a challenge that we're still navigating now, was overcoming the fact that collections locations such as drawers are generally not static. So meaning that a drawer can very easily be moved into a different cabinet and they often do for collections management reasons. And this immediately divorces the physical drawer from its digital label. So to circumvent this, we physically labeled all of the locations in the collections so that in the event a drawer was moved and a digital record not updated immediately, which happens more often than not, um, we could work out where the location had originally come from and then backtrack those changes. Maps and floor plans are also extremely helpful, particularly when you have lots of people working in a collection or space that they may not be familiar with. So that was really useful to help people navigate an area. <clears throat> So as well as sorting out our locations records, it was also really important for us to record the type of cabinetry that our collections are stored in. So there were some more standard common cabinets that we found across the collections, alongside lots of unique and historical cabinets as are common in museums. Um, and overall, we recorded 531 unique cabinet types, which fall into 15 broad categories. And it was really surprising how many cabinets looked very similar, but in fact, when you went to measure them, had slightly different measurements that we needed to account for. So this is a very, very tiny subset of the different types of cabinetry that we have across the museum. And a really key learning from this process was to create a list of cabinetry as early as possible, because this was not only useful for volumetric calculations, but this is also really key in feeding into the design of the cabinetry at the new site. So once we had standardized our locations data, ensured every location had a digital record, a physical label, and had been associated to a cabinet type, we could actually begin collecting the data that we started out to collect in the first place. Mm -hmm. um, so this included internal and external measurements of storage units so that collections footprint and volume could be calculated and this data could then feed into decision-making. Um, this was in theory an easy and straightforward task. However, when you have as many different furniture types as we did, some of which I've just shown you, this can actually prove very complex, um, and it was really important to ensure measurements were consistent, to make sure that everybody was measuring in the same way, which is you know, easier said than done, um, making sure that people were using consistent units, etc. And something that we also found really useful was to actually build a database of standard measurements, because a lot of our cabinets, even though the shell may look slightly different and have different measurements, they actually quite often contain the same size and type of drawers. Um, so building this database enabled us to attribute measurements to standard drawer sizes quickly and easily, which saves us lots of time in the long run. But there are always edge cases in museums, as we know. Um, the main one that we encountered was freestanding items. So for example, very big specimen, crates, crates of specimens outside of cabinets because there isn't space, etc. So in this case, we measured the item itself to its widest dimensions. Um, and if the item had a base or armature or was any kind of stand that it would likely to be likely to stay on. Um, we also measured, included this in the measurements so that that could be accommodated for in future. We also recorded whether items were to be considered permanent freestanding. So for example, this big skull here that Izzy is measuring, we would consider permanent freestanding. Um, or if something was considered temporary freestanding because of space constraints. So for example, crates of specimens, which if there was actually space available in a cabinet could be rehoused in our main collections. Other fun edge cases we encountered included cabinets within cabinets, um, specimens which come above drawer height, which is what you can see here in this example on the bottom right, and specimens which we can only describe as being stored in the wrong or suboptimal orientation. So for example, in the bottom left, these are slabs which are stored in vertical roller racking, but actually for accessibility and safety reasons, they should be stored horizontally um, in future. And now Ellie is gonna talk about occupancy and decompression. So alongside the internal and external measurements of storage units, such as drawers or shelves, we also needed to know how full they were and whether the specimens within them needed any extra space in order to be stored optimally. We did this using the metrics of occupancy and decompression, where occupancy is the 2D assessment of the space that specimens take up within a storage unit, and decompression is the extra space that they need to be stored optimally. There's lots of different requirements across the collections moving to TVSP, so in order to carry out this assessment effectively, we needed to create something called decompression categories, um, which captured these specific needs. 
For example, the one that's on the screen, rocks, minerals, macrofossils, and specimens, 90% robust, means that specimens can tessellate within the drawers. Um, they can touch, however, they should not be stacked on top of one another. Here are some examples of some draw occupancies. The first draw that you can see is 100%. Um, the specimens aren't crowded together, but you can't put anything else in the drawer and there's nothing stacked on top of each other. The next one, we do have some space. So there's around 30% space available for other specimens, so it's 70%. And finally, the last one is quite a crowded drawer. Things are on top of each other. It needs some more space to be stored optimally. We've assessed that it needs around one more drawer's worth of space. Next, I'm going to talk about the data from the point of view of the team's on-the-ground data collecting. Um, 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 and if you, if you would like more information about the data itself or the database, we can pass on questions to our data team. Um, we carried out data collection in a number of phases over a number of months from 2019 through to 2022, and we needed to collect spatial data for over 200,000 locations, so it wasn't a small task. Um, a key learning was the importance of setting up the data collection process in the most effective way. Otherwise, you may look like this when you look at your data. Um, and we definitely learned this during our initial stages of data collection in 2020, um, which was not the most joined up exercise. And we collected slightly different data across the collections. Due to this, we had to carry out some reconciliation um, and some cleansing in order to join the databases up into one. So we definitely learned from this um, in further stages of data collection. And we did it in a much more standard and efficient way. This included creating a standardized data template. This is a small portion of one of these here. And these included location information and other columns for each pieces of data that you needed to collect, which really helped the process. Um, so the ideal process that we would recommend if you were doing this type of project is to ensure that you have a good understanding of the data that you need before you start, standardize the way that you collect and record the data, and write down key processes and decisions. So once we had this, um, this, bat, this in place, um, we went on to collecting the data and the largest um, phases of data collection. And during these phases, um, teams of collections move assistants and curatorial assistants move through the collections to collect the data. We had a large team in place with sometimes up to 18 people working at one time. So it was a large undertaking that required lots of coordination, including navigating the pandemic. In order to carry this out effectively, we followed the following stages. Firstly, coordinating and scheduling, where we went, uh, we organized with the curatorial teams. We got our um, templates generated for the different collections areas that we were in, and we uh, made trackers so that we could track um, our progress. Next, we of course moved on to the data collection itself, where the teams would go through measuring, assessing, and mapping. We then moved on to a spot checking phase where around 10% of the locations within each data template were flagged and a different team would come through and look through these, look for, look for any inconsistencies or issues. And we did find some issues early on this way. So this was very useful. We would then move on to a data cleansing phase where we would go through and check the data for accuracy and for completeness. And then we would finally send it off to our data team, IMT. Uh, sometimes they would come back to us with further inconsistencies or issues. But once those were fixed, we would move, uh, we would send the data to be ingested into the database where it could be used for um, spatial analysis, volumetric calculations, and to inform other project decisions. So to wrap up, some lessons learned. Um, so firstly, ensure that you have a good understanding of what you need before you start, um, especially when you're working with such a large amount of data and as such a large project, understand the questions you need to answer because um, that will inform the data that you need to collect. Next, develop a process for updating the data early on. This is a challenge that we're facing at the moment because we have all of this amazing data, um, but of course the collections aren't static. They move around, things change. Um, so developing a way, an easy way of updating the data is really important and also getting collections users on board to update the data is crucial and difficult. Um, record key processes and decisions is another key lessons learned. Don't keep them in people's heads, write them down. And finally, if you're doing a project like this, ensure that you have appropriate resources and time available for the size of the project. And as Katie said at the beginning, this was a massive, massive team effort with lots of colleagues across the museum working together. So we'd like to say a massive thank you and a shout out to the data collection team, data management teams, 
the MOVES team, and of course, all of the curatorial teams that work on this project. And please do get in touch with KTRI if you have any questions um, and for more specific questions about data or data management, Kath McGuire from our data team is very happy to take questions. And also before I go, we do have two collections move assistant roles available in our team. So if you guys, anyone in the audience or anyone you know fancies helping us prepare 38 million specimens to move, please join our team, um, chat to me or Katie or check out the NHM Jobs website. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, so again, very timely, thank you. Uh, does anybody have any questions? Oh, yep, maybe over there. Um, just briefly about the books that were mentioned. I'm a librarian, so I'm, I'm interested in that move. Uh, could you talk a bit more about um, the data collection there and what you think that people will use it? Could you repeat the question? Yeah. Um, so we had a question about the uh, library material that we'll be moving. Me and Katie work in the paleontology collections. So if you, you're welcome to get in touch with us and we can pass it on to our library team. But we are moving with sectional, sectional libraries related to all the collections moving. And they also had to carry out this process. But as it's very similar library material, they did it in a much easier way. It was a bit more straightforward. So it took them far less time. I think they did it in linear meters. They just measured the amount of books. So I, I wish we were them, um, but please do <laughs> pass on any questions that you have and we can pass them on. Anybody else? Um, one question I had was, so do you know that you will have more space to move to, or is it the same or is it less? We, obviously we don't make the decisions about <laughs> um, we will have enough space for the things that are moving. And I think there will be space for some decompression. Um, so, But we may not have the space to decompress everything beautifully that we maybe thought Perfect. we would have had at the start. Uh, but more than we currently have, which is great. And and much more better storage than our current leaky historic building. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Great. Um, anyone else? Has, um, yeah. I was curious about the um, the old encampment, um, which some of them will be in terms of you know, particular infections. Are these being kept or is everything moving to like new encampment? Yeah, so the question was about our historic cabinetry and if we will keep any of that, because obviously a lot of that is integral to the history of a collection. So the answer is yes, a lot of that will be kept if it's still stable and usable. So for example, the micropaleontology collection that we're moving is mostly slide cabinets. Uh, so they're one of the collections that have cabinets within cabinets. So you'll go and there'll be like slide cabinets on a shelf. A lot of these are historic, they're still stable. So those collections will probably actually just move in those cabinets. Um, so yeah, anything historic will be kept. And also if we have historic cabinetry that we don't want to keep collections in, that's likely to either go to exhibitions or kind of be kept for like other uses. So we won't throw any nice mahogany away if we can avoid it. <laughs> Unless you worked in the entomology department and they were rehoming lots of cabinets and you've got a couple in your house. <laughs> I paid for them, it's all above board. <laughs> um, Okay, any any others? Got time for a last question if we want to, otherwise we can move on to the next talk. Okay, good, right. Um, thank you, thank you so much. much. That was fascinating. <laughs>